Tonight, as everyone is counting down to the royal wedding, this is World News from London, England. And first up in the headlines, storm warning. 85 million Americans watching the sky. Another round of terrifying twisters and raging rivers on the rise. In cold blood, nine Americans executed in Afghanistan. The gunman was supposed to be on the U.S. side. Born in the USA, President Obama shows the world his full birth certificate, saying the times are too serious for silliness. Donald Trump fires back. And from here in London, rehearsal night, the royal couple practicing for Friday. As we bring you the lessons of all those royal women who traveled the same path as Kate will ride to the Abbey. From ABC News, this is a special edition of World News with Diane Sawyer. The Royal Wedding. And good evening tonight from London. Behind me is Buckingham Palace, where on Friday, right there on that balcony, another royal couple will appear connecting us to the dramatic centuries of British history. And we'll have more on what happened here in London today. But we do begin, as we have so many nights this week in the United States, with tornadoes bearing down in state after state. 85 million Americans worried about what this night of weather will bring. Violent storms and along raging rivers rising by the hour. There is heavy new damage from Texas to Tennessee. At least 11 more people have been killed today, bringing the toll for the week to 22. And ABC's Steve Osinsami starts us off in Moody, Alabama tonight. Steve. Good evening, Diane. There are tornado warnings up all across the state. Ten at last count. The sky is getting dark. The wind is already starting to blow. This morning, they say there was no warning, no sirens whatsoever. All of a sudden, the top of this home was blown away. It's the never-ending storm. This was from a live camera late this afternoon in Coleman, Alabama. This was surveillance video from a salvage yard in Covington, Mississippi. Both locations were blown to pieces. In Coleman, a tornado hit the hospital and the courthouse. Hours later, just after 6 a.m., the tornado was bearing down on families in Alabama. I felt the bed shaking, and that's when I jumped up. Like nothing left. At Wendy Pesnell's home, it's all gone. Just kind of like it makes you stop and you think, you know, wow, you know, we're here one minute and we'll be gone the next. George Bearden says it happened so fast they didn't have time to run for cover. Is this your wall on the floor here? Yeah, that was the front of the house. That was the front of the house. One woman down the road was killed. His family was lucky they got out alive. Pieces of our house scattered all over two or three counties, I think. But uh, like I said, we're alive. We survived it. It's been about every day, every six hours or so, we'll have tornadoes, severe damage around the area. The map is ugly. Tornadoes across several states, more than 45 of them since this morning, one after another, 20 alone in Alabama. And there's so much rain. Across the Midwest, there's now major flooding along the Mississippi and Ohio rivers. This SUV in Clarksville, Indiana, was surrounded by rising waters. A parking lot in Metropolis, Illinois, was transformed into a lake. And in Branson, Missouri, families were scrambling today to beat the flood. My dad's born and raised here. Um, we've never seen it this bad. In Cairo, Illinois, they've got a tough decision coming. They just might break the levee upstream to save the town. But if they do that, they'll sacrifice hundreds of acres of farms. They're headed to court to fight it out. At least 10 people have already been killed so far in these storms this week. Diane. Thank you, Steve. Every day, so much loss. And we shift now to a strange day in American politics. President Obama pressured to produce his full birth certificate more than two years into office, saying it's time to stop the sideshows and carnival barkers. But within minutes, Donald Trump had punched back. And Jake Tapper is at the White House for us tonight. Jake. Diane, some advisors cautioned the president not to address this issue because a long protracted discussion by Republican presidential candidates about where the president was born could help make those Republicans look unserious. But ultimately, President Obama decided that this birther nonsense was just too much of a distraction. 
It's the lie that would not die. He doesn't have a birth certificate. Now, he may have one, but there's something on that birth, maybe religion, maybe it says he's a Muslim, I don't know. This really is the biggest hoax ever contemplated against our country in 200 years. President Obama came before the American people today to provide even more documentation that he was born in the U.S. and is thus constitutionally eligible for the position he holds. I was born in Hawaii, August 4th, 1961, in Kapi'olani Hospital. The birther smear appears to have been hatched in an anonymous email campaign in the spring of 2008. Then Senator Obama responded by posting on his campaign website the certification of live birth at Hawaii issues. But for some, that was not enough. Nor were the 1961 birth announcements in Honolulu's major newspapers. The lie persisted. If I had some DNA, it wouldn't assuage those that don't believe he was born here. Their numbers have been growing. 43% of all Americans say the president was either not born in the U.S. or they're not sure where he was born, according to polls, including two-thirds of Republicans and almost half of independents. The president said polling did not prompt today's action. Instead, he cited how earlier this month a budget debate between him and Republicans was overshadowed by possible Republican presidential candidate Donald Trump's bombastic birther bunk. So, last week, the president sent a letter to Hawaii's director of health requesting that the state make an exception and provide him with certified copies of his original birth certificate. We're not going to be able to solve our problems if we get distracted by sideshows and carnival barkers. In New Hampshire today, a triumphant Trump. I feel I've accomplished something really, really important, and I'm honored by it. Late this afternoon, Diane, President Obama, in a taping of the Oprah Winfrey show to air on Monday, said that of course he knew that he was born in the U.S. He was there. He remembered it. Diane? All right, Jake. I want to bring you George Stephanopoulos now, because, George, we just heard Jake say that a lot of the staff said don't do this to the president. He did it anyway. Why now when this has been around for so long? Well, I think he realized it was in his political interest to keep it going a little bit longer as well. But in the long run, uh, I think he also knew that to have the question of this significant portion of the American public, as wrong as they were in their beliefs, believed that he wasn't born in the United States, and to question the legitimacy of him as president was not a good thing. So it was better to put it away once and for all, uh, even though it was really driven to the top of the news cycle by Donald Trump. That's it. It vaulted Donald Trump back into the headlines again. So what does this mean now for the Republican field? And Trump has been polling number one or number two. And also Trump and his non-candidacy candidacy. <laughs> well, my guess is he's probably going to go up even a little bit more uh, with this. And actually, the president might not be all too displeased with that uh, either. But he's going to have to face real questions about whether he is indeed a serious candidate and whether he can withstand the scrutiny. Uh, of a campaign. But as for the other Republican candidates, Diane, I think they are all breathing, and, and I talked to representatives of several of them today, all breathing a big sigh of relief. They don't like this issue. It's not a good issue for them. They're happy to have it go away. Maybe case closed. Okay, thank you, George Stephanopoulos, tonight. And now we move on to the massacre of nine Americans in Afghanistan. Eight military and a contractor by an Afghan Air Force officer. The shooter lined up the Americans in a meeting room at the Kabul airport, apparently shooting them execution style. Martha Raddatz on what this means to the 100,000 men and women fighting there tonight. It was a massacre smack in the middle of a highly guarded Air Force complex at the Kabul airport. The nine Americans were meeting in a conference room with a group of Afghan airmen to discuss the training, all of them armed with an American-supplied handgun. Suddenly, a 48-year-old Afghan pilot, a 20-year veteran, began arguing, erupting in anger and storming out. Within minutes, he returned with his U.S.-issued handgun drawn. U.S. officials tell ABC News he ordered the Americans and Afghans to drop their weapons and line up. That's when he opened fire, execution style. The eight American service members and one U.S. contractor were killed, the five Afghans badly wounded. The shooter then took his own life. Across the complex chaos, the sounds of gunfire and soldiers scrambling, some jumping out of windows to escape. ABC's Mike no Betcher was, was at the airport. The that sirens were going off and people were being 
herded into hardened buildings and told there was a situation. The Afghan pilot's family said he was under financial strain and depressed with no connection to the Taliban. This is the seventh time this year that Afghan troops have turned on American and NATO forces. The level of trust in the Afghans will be even more shaken after today. In fact, since 2009, 24 U.S. military personnel have been killed by Afghan forces, but this horrific day is by far the worst. And Diane, I have already gotten emails from some in the military saying, what are we fighting for? Well, Martha, thank you for bringing us the story tonight. And we do have other news about the U.S. in Afghanistan, and it affects the U.S. around the globe as well. President Obama will announce a shakeup in his national security team tomorrow, changes that have been long rumored. We have confirmed that Leon Panetta, now the CIA director, will be named defense secretary, taking over for Robert Gates in the late summer. And General David Petraeus, now the top commander for the U.S. in Afghanistan, will return to the U.S., to head the CIA in the fall. And now here in London, the city has been transformed into a kind of wedding command center electrified by a secret rehearsal with the bride and groom tonight. And Nick Watt has been tracking the action. He's at Methodist Hall right now, Nick. Good evening, Diane. Well, Kate and William have just been and gone. They were here at this 1,000 year old abbey for their final rehearsal. They slipped into the abbey through a side door. Post-rehearsal, the paparazzi caught a very happy bride and groom driving away. In 36 hours, they'll be back with two billion people watching, doing this for real. This afternoon, this was the scene outside Kate's hotel. Is the wedding dress in there? There's Kate's dad. What's in his bag? Kate at the wheel. Is that the wedding hairdo? Kate taking a box out of the trunk. What's inside? Meanwhile, last-minute rehearsals for fly-past pilots, horseback horn players, and in the pre-dawn quiet, all the Queen's horses and all the Queen's men. No more far off, company, sir! A full rehearsal. Sir Malcolm Ross was once the Queen's master of the household, choreographing such events. What can go wrong? Nothing. Nick, nothing must go wrong. Today, not just flowers, but 20-foot trees taken into the abbey to decorate. I'm happy. It's very exciting. I think it's a little bit of a historical moment. Historic because Kate's what they call a commoner. No blue blood. Her mum's family were coal miners. From coal mining to future Queen of England, I mean, it's an astonishing story. It is a fairy tale, frankly. Now, Diane, this time tomorrow night, Kate will be with her family in that hotel and Prince William, he'll be at St. James's Palace just around the corner. A quiet night in with his father, Prince Charles. And you and I will be seeing each other a lot in the days to come. Thank you, Nick. And still ahead on World News, we sent David Muir on a simple mission. In this country facing so many budget cuts, how do they really feel about the royal spectacle? And that sisterhood of royal women Kate Middleton's about to join 50 years along the same path. What are the lessons? This is ABC World News with Diane Sawyer, brought to you by Purina. Purina One Beyond, a new food for your cat or dog. Can't stop weeding? Then apply Preen for gardens. In just one application, Preen prevents weeds for three months. Stop weeds with Preen. Preen works so you don't have to. Imagine facing the day with less chronic low back pain. Imagine living your life with less chronic osteoarthritis pain. Imagine you with less pain. Cymbalta can help. Cymbalta is a non-narcotic treatment that's FDA approved to manage chronic musculoskeletal pain. One pill a day, every day, can help reduce this pain. Tell your doctor right away if your mood worsens, you have unusual changes in mood or behavior, or thoughts of suicide. 
Antidepressants can increase these in children, teens, and young adults. Cymbalta is not approved for children under 18. People taking MAOIs or thyroidazine or with uncontrolled glaucoma should not take Cymbalta. Taking it with NSAID pain relievers, aspirin, or blood thinners may increase bleeding risk. Severe liver problems, some fatal, were reported. Signs include abdominal pain and yellowing of the skin or eyes. Talk with your doctor about your medicines, including those for migraine, or if you have high fever, confusion, and stiff muscles to address a possible life-threatening condition. Tell your doctor about alcohol use, liver disease, and before you reduce or stop taking Cymbalta. Dizziness or fainting may occur upon standing. Side effects include nausea, dry mouth, and constipation. Ask your doctor about Cymbalta. Imagine you with less pain. Cymbalta can help. Go to Cymbalta.com to learn about a free trial offer. And from London tonight, it's been almost a year and a half since the United States and the British decided on very different solutions to the same problem, epic spending deficits. Here in England, they took drastic measures, cutting deeply right away. So we wondered, how do the people feeling the sting of those cuts view the splendor of the royal wedding? And David Vera went out to find out today. Hello, David. Hi, Diane. Great to see you here in London. And so many of the people, when you travel through London, will tell you that they're facing so many of the problems Americans are facing back home. As Diane mentioned, unemployment, huge deficits, and now an opulent royal wedding. But we learned today that many here welcome it. It was the image of that moment. The cocoon around Prince Charles and Camilla was punctured. Their Rolls Royce hit with paint, windows shattered, as the anger and frustration here boiled over. After giant cuts passed by the government here, $133 billion over four years. While back in the U.S., Congress just finished a bruising battle over cutting less than 1% of that. In the U.K., they've cut college funding by 40%, public housing 60%, retirement age moved up to 66 and so the people here, desperate for relief, have found themselves desperate for this royal escape, too. It's about exuberant wanting so much as we need this wedding. We need this wedding to make a turnaround of some kind. There have been royal turnarounds before. When Charles and Diana were married, 2.5 million Brits were on the dole, as they say, getting unemployment. That same giant number they now face again today. The difference, though, now, so much has already been pared down. At the time of the royal wedding, for instance, before with Diana and Charles, there was, for instance, a royal yacht. The two of them went off on a, a, on a big honeymoon cruise. The royal yacht is now a museum. That yacht now docked forever. The royal train barely used. And at the core of this country, just like the U.S., that disappearing engine, those British factories after World War II, now a fraction of what they were. This is one of those shops where you can get trinkets for the royal wedding. How are you? I first picked up the William and Kate Where spoon. Where was it made? China. Where was this made? China. <laughs> they can hear the uh, money bells yeah. too. That is, of course, rankles very hard with the British people. The Prime Minister has said, everybody must have a street party. And there's a slight sense of kind of mandating. We have to celebrate. We have to say we're here. We're surviving. We headed to Westminster Station, the subway, the tube as they call it. Martin Perry told us this country needs this wedding. I think we've got our work cut out. Even Frances Bully will be watching after watching her job disappear. Studying to be a lawyer, her paid internship at a law firm is now gone with the cuts. When were you told that it needs? I was told maybe three weeks ago. So you just found out? Quite recently, yeah. That the internship is done because of the cuts? Yes. A young woman whose opportunity was cut short by those drastic cuts here in Britain, and yet on Friday she'll be celebrating another young woman, Kate Middleton. She said, although it's a fairy tale playing out before billions of people watching, that she hopes it will also change the fortunes here in Britain so many people face. Change the spirit, change the fortunes, and how much is the wedding predicted to bring in? Anywhere between 700 million and a billion dollars, so maybe that will bring some good fortune, literally. Okay. All right, we'll be back out on the streets again tomorrow, David. Thanks. And coming up, those expired prescriptions in your medicine cabinet, we all have them. Which ones could do you harm? Do you know? We take it a day at a time. That's how it is with Alzheimer's disease. She needs help from me and her medication. The Exline patch, it releases medication continuously for 24 hours. She uses one Exelon patch daily for the treatment of mild to moderate Alzheimer's symptoms. It cannot change the course of the disease. Hospitalization and rarely death have been reported in patients who wore more than one patch at a time. The most common side effects of Exelon patch are nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. The likelihood and severity of these side effects may increase as the dose increases. Patients may experience loss of appetite or weight. 
Patients who weigh less than 110 pounds may experience more side effects. People at risk for stomach ulcers who take certain other medicines should talk to their doctor because serious stomach problems such as bleeding may worsen. People with certain heart conditions may experience low heart rate. Whenever I needed her, she was there for me. Now, I'm here for her. Ask the doctor about your loved one trying the Exelon Patch. Visit ExelonPatch.com to learn more. Here's why Bino is different than these gas relievers. These you take after food gives you gas. You take Bino before so you don't get gas. And if you don't get gas, maybe you don't need these. Take Bino before and they'll be no gas. This is not a prescription. This is Stacy, who runs circles around asthma. And Dan, he never lets high cholesterol get him too low. And Amy, with her arthritis well in hand. They go to Walgreens, where their pharmacist not only refills prescriptions, but gives advice, immunizations, and health tests. Staying on top of your health starts right in your neighborhood. Walgreens, there's a way to stay well. For strong bones, I take calcium. But my doctor told me that most calcium supplements aren't absorbed properly unless taken with food. He recommended Citricow. It's different. It's calcium citrate, so it can be absorbed with or without food. Citricow. And 98 years of tradition were turned upside down today, not here in London, but back in Washington, when America's top money man, Fed Chairman Ben Bernanke, held the first press briefing in Fed history, promising more to come. He predicted a slight slowdown in the economic recovery and an uptick in inflation with gas prices on the rise. And tonight, a new look at America's changing families. It turns out one in four children in America now being raised by a single parent, a percentage that's been climbing for years. Researchers say one reason is the shift toward greater acceptance, though they say single parents are more likely to live in poverty. And an eye-opening look inside all those bulging medicine cabinets. We don't throw out our medications, as we all know. Well, today, millions of old prescriptions we have inside are featured in a new report which says that all those pills can lead to painkiller abuse among children. And for older Americans, medication mix-ups and contaminate our drinking water when they're flushed. So be sure to throw them away different ways or combine the old pills with coffee grinds or kitty litter and put them in the garbage. Police departments, by the way, across the country in the U.S. are going to be collecting unused medicine on Saturday. And a revealing new snapshot tonight of our changing appetite when we go out to eat with burgers and fries fading pretty fast. While McDonald's is still the top U.S. chain, Burger King and Wendy's have bounced from the number two and three spots down and moving in Subway in second place, followed by Starbucks. No burgers on the menu at either of those. And coming up, life lessons from all the other women along the path as Kate Middleton in that car travels toward her wedding. I can't enjoy my own barbecue with these nasal allergies. I know what works differently than many other allergy medications. Omneris, Omneris to the nose. Did you know nasal symptoms like congestion can be caused by allergic inflammation? Omneris relieves your symptoms by fighting inflammation. Side effects may include headache, nosebleed, and sore throat. I toss those allergy symptoms out of my party. Omneris, ask your doctor. Battling nasal allergy symptoms? Omneris combats the cause. Get Omneris for only $11 at Omneris.com. Ready for the most amazing miracle Grow results ever? Spectacular plants without all the weeds with miracle Grow Shake and Feed Plus Weed Preventer. Just a few shakes stops weeds before they start. Plants grow twice as big with almost no weeds, even in your vegetable garden. Want three months of feeding without all the weeding? All you need is Shake and Feed Plus Weed Preventer. Hello, sunshine, sweet as you can be. Wake up to sweetness with Honey Nut Cheerio Cereal. Kissed with real honey and the 100% natural whole grain oats can help lower your cholesterol. You are so sweet to me. Be happy, be healthy. For three hours a week, I'm a coach. But when I was diagnosed with prostate cancer, I needed a coach. Our doctor was great, but with so many tough decisions, I felt lost. United Healthcare offered a specially trained RN who helped us weigh and understand all our options. 
For me, cancer was as scary as a fastball is to some of these kids, but my coach had hit that pitch before. Turning data into useful answers, we're 78,000 people looking out for 70 million Americans. That's health in numbers. United Healthcare. A fiber that is taste-free is a welcome change. A fiber that dissolves completely is clearly different. Benefiber is the easy way to get more fiber every day. That's the beauty of Benefiber. With just 24 hours left, Robin Roberts, Barbara Walters and Diane Sawyer in London reveal all the last-minute hush-hush details you want to know. The exciting final hours before the royal wedding are on Good Morning America in London tomorrow on ABC. And finally tonight from London, on her wedding day, two billion people, including us, will be watching Kate Middleton as she heads toward her wedding. But we wondered, as she sits quietly in the car with her own thoughts, will she hear the whispered voices of all the women before her who traveled the exact same route when they walked into history? A bride with her heart pounding, traveling through an echo chamber of the royal brides before starting at the place where she and her family are getting ready. Here it is, the Goring Hotel, and we are told that Mr. Middleton just went in right before we arrived here. It is a hotel so identified with the Queen Mother. You may think of her most as the wife in that movie who persuaded her husband to get help with his stammer. And down comes Her Royal Highness. Mm. All right, Betty. Yes. It's actually quite good fun. We know the bride is going to be arriving in a car, breaking with tradition on the carriage. So I'm going to take her route in my own slightly, slightly less elegant car. Within minutes after leaving her hotel, she'll pass by the place where Diana once also set out on this journey. Lady Diana Spencer. A veil covering her face. A few minutes after that, the crossroads where once her groom walked behind a casket and his brother left a note for mummy. And then she rounds the final corner to Westminster Abbey. So pull up in your car and take the walk. It's a short one, not far at all, right up to the doors to the future. And when she leaves in her open carriage and looks out at the streets, the people who've gathered for centuries to watch British ceremonies will be standing behind those who are gathered for her today. And up ahead, Buckingham Palace where Queen Elizabeth II left for her coronation to begin her 60-year reign. And right there is the balcony. It's fairly low. We think of it as very high, but it's fairly low. So you see people stretch down, but not so far beneath you. The balcony, where once the Queen Mother stood with her daughter Queen Elizabeth and her sister Margaret, celebrating the end of the war with Winston Churchill. And a half century later, you had standing on the balcony the same three women as who were there in 1945. And Kate will be part of that history now. And we will, of course, be watching as she is part of that history. Don't forget to set your alarms. ABC's coverage begins at 4 a.m. Friday morning. We thank you for watching. We're always on at abcnews.com, Nightline later, and I'll see you tomorrow night. What will it be like?